Well, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the broadcast. You're watching Morning Express, a few minutes past 6 a.m. Welcome to the broadcast. We definitely appreciate your presence, even as we get to usher in the weekend in style. We definitely take a look at the latest developments. It has been a busy week. So, of course, the week in review will be quite heated. We'll take a look at what is happening in Parliament, even as the fifth session of the 12th Parliament resumed its sittings. Farther on, we'll also take a look at the wrangles within Jubilee Party, Irungu Kangata being dehwipped, Wamatangi taking that particular position. Also, the senators who were actually expelled from Jubilee Party, yes, they did appeal, but we will definitely deliberate on those intrigues. Not just that, touching on the judiciary, the race to succeed the former Chief Justice David Maraga is on, even as applicants, were, the names of the applicants rather, were released by the JSC. We'll definitely continue vetting this, even as we anticipate much more to happen in the coming days. Once again, welcome to the broadcast. I'm Jesse Rogers. Let's take a look at what is happening in the international dailies. We'll begin with the Daily Monitor right now. And, of course, some of the stories highlighted. Two sentenced to 100 years in jail for killing a police officer. That's the latest in Uganda. Quite a hefty sentence right there in terms of aggravated robbery, murder, and kidnap. Also, a UPDF helicopter crashed in Entebbe with two cadet trainees on board. Unfortunate right there. Let's take a look at what's happening in Rwanda this time round. Rwanda today, first story investments in Rwanda are falling by 47% even as there's an increase of 52% of the total in terms of foreign direct investments to Rwanda. Tough times right there, even as the African Union conflict warning system needs urgent upgrade. That's according to latest report in terms of helping to stop fighting before it begins. Uganda restoring social media. Well, Facebook is still blocked. We'll definitely continue monitoring the state of affairs in our neighbors. Over to the citizen, or rather the east, well, let's take a look at the citizen this time round. CCM lawmaker speaks about pneumonia killing Tanzanians. Interesting. Now, a Tanzanian lawmaker on Thursday expressed concerns over what he termed as growing deaths of pneumonia or asking the government to openly explain the disease. Well, this coming at a time when the country has definitely um, segregated itself in terms of what we've seen with other countries in the fight against COVID-19. Well, pressure definitely mounting there, even as reports come from the country that various high-profile leaders in the military have actually passed on. We'll continue monitoring this state of affairs. Let's take a look at the East African right now. Kenjan bags geothermal deal in Djibouti. One of the stories highlighted there in terms of the state-owned electricity producer, which will drill three geothermal wells in the Horn of Africa country. Even as senior South Sudan officials have tested positive for COVID-19. Definitely showing the impetus we should put in fighting or rather sticking to the guidelines released by the Ministry of Health. Let's take a look at what's the latest from CNN in terms of world breaking news where we well know of the protest in India. In case you don't know, farmers are actually up in arms in terms of the latest legislation bills that were passed that might see them affected in terms of pricing of their farm outputs. This has definitely caused mass uh, protest in the country, bearing in mind the population of farmers in that particular country, which has definitely seen a stalemate between the government offices in that country with the protesting farmers. Some being an arrested, uh, well, of course, the prime minister definitely holding on to his gun, saying the best he could do is just postpone that particular bill but not remove it in totality. Of course, that's the latest in terms of what has been highlighted on the international pages. We'll definitely keep you updated even as we take a look at the local dailies right now. And joining me just to help me deliberate on this particular matters that have been highlighted on the standard as well as the Daily Nation is, I'll start with Professor Gitile Naituli, who's a former NCIC commissioner 
joining us via way of Zoom. He's, na he's in Nakuru County. We're also joined by Mark Bichachi, who's a communication strategist. Always a pleasure to see you, gentlemen. Many thanks for your time and waking up as well. I know it's not quite easy, but you know what they say, the early bird does definitely catch the worm. Let's catch the worms in the dailies, quote unquote. We'll begin with the standard right now. On the front page, it seems to be, well, bad news in terms of the health sector, even as the vaccine will take a longer period to be distributed amongst Kenyans. Um, on the front page of the standard, it says the government first promised that the job would be in Kenya by the second half of January. This then changed to a Valentine's Day gift promise with Valentine's just a few days away. Internal documents now reveal that the state hopes to bring or to begin distributing the life-saving vaccine later this year. Even as the health cabinet secretary has been quoted right there saying Kenya has prioritized the vaccination of 1.25 million people between February and June 2021 when it is expected that global vaccine stocks will be limited. Well, this is an intricate balance, bearing in mind the demand for COVID vaccines across the globe. We well know the rich countries, which definitely um, give, um, gave impetus early on in the year once the vaccines were out. But uh, be that as it may, let me start with you, Mark Bichachi. What do you make of this in terms of that particular deployment of the vaccination plan? Well, you know, the, the difficulty internationally in acquiring the vaccines is, is well uh, documented. That, however, does not give our government excuse in terms of delaying the vaccine uh, to the people. At the end of the day, we must be very, very proactive on this particular matter. And as the saying goes, that we should never waste a good uh, crisis. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic is indeed a huge crisis. Now, the question I have for our government is number one, have we explored every alternative route there is? If you look at Uganda, for example, uh, Yurika Gutam Seveni is on record uh, trying to push for, for uh, the, the, the um, uh, in, uh, research institutions within Uganda to try and find Ugandan solutions. Just the same way as we pushed for PPEs, just the same way as we pushed uh, to get masks made in Kenya. Uh, perhaps it is time for us to also figure out whether we can um, uh, find out ways of making uh, these this vaccines and, and Kenyan solutions. Now, I can see Professor laughing because I, uh, I think he's forgotten that as a professor, this is one of the things <laughs> that uh, he used to push for in Egerton University, if I remember correctly. So that is number one. Number two is we need to position ourselves as a country and, and fight tooth and nail to ensure that those vaccines get into this country. We understand that every country is fighting for it. We understand that every country richer and poorer than us is fighting for it. But we must use every channel, diplomatic, uh, financial, uh, whatever channel we may have to ensure that that vaccine um, gets to Kenyans and Kenyans are able to go back to normalcy as quickly as possible. And let's not forget that we need to get the vaccine before we get the other strains of COVID that are ravaging the UK and, and South Africa. So uh, time is of the essence. We need all forms of ingenuity, uh, all sense, uh, sense of uh, craftiness. Perhaps we need to borrow from India, uh, which decided to do away with international patents to make its own drugs. So we need to act with speed. That, that is my message to, to my government. Okay, Professor Gitil and I too, perhaps even as you explain why you were laughing it's also proper to note that this will cost taxpayers a total of 34 billion but also concerns have been raised about the effectiveness of the vaccine according to the document uh, the ministry of health still supports the acquisition of astrazeneca due to its low price and cold chain requirements of two to eight degrees celsius what do you make of it professor <laughs> Yes, uh, I was loving because I, I like the church uh, comments. He's one of these very optimistic Kenyans. And it's wonderful to have people like him in this country. <laughs> the thing is, we will never really in this country ever be able to do anything useful as long as we lack discipline and as long as we are this corrupt. Every undertaking in Kenya must produce personal benefit 
to the people in the church until we send that image, until we send that horrible desire of personal aggrandizement for everything that we do, we will never be able to do anything. You remember the car, there was a Nyayo car. Uh, we have ventured into quite a few things, but our discipline has never been able to allow us to do anything. Now, why I was laughing? The church knows that the human systems are collapsing across the country. Because also the way we choose the managers. Uh, we reward loyalty. We don't choose the people because they can actually deliver for Kenya. We we'll choose them, give them one job, because either they are very loyal or they are very stupid. It's unfortunate. Uh, meritocracy, which took root under Kebaki, uh, kind of uh, disappeared. So we have challenges. But uh, why I like Bichazi's optimism is because these challenges can be overcome. You see, the president will have been forced to reach out to the military. And I don't know why we have not involved the military in the industrialization of this country from the very beginning. Because all the countries in the world which has made progress are the countries that deployed the discipline of the armed forces, if I want to use that term, in the production, in civilian activities. Because for some reason, the training, the training allows them to focus on achieving the objectives, achieving the mission. So as a country, we have a problem, and we can also see it in the primary schools, in secondary schools, where the children are burning buildings, that in display. We see it in the political class, it must be unrest for us to be able to serve this country better, to be able to deliver those vaccines on time, to be able to deliver any project in good time and for the purposes of serving Kenyans. Okay. So this extreme selfishness that we have cultivated, it had to be dealt with. All right, Professor. Well, well said. Let, let's also uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce uh, Kasim Tandaza, who's a member of Parliament for Matuga. He's just joined us in our studios. Many thanks for your time. We're just highlighting some of the stories in the dailies. One of them being the fact that Kenyans might have to wait for longer for the COVID-19 vaccine. According to the report, um, Kenyans, the first group rather of Kenyans, will get the job in the third quarter of the next financial year. That is from January 2022. A sharp contrast from what some of the health ministry officials were saying in terms of mid-February. Um, but anyway, as you give us your take, Kasim Tandaza, on this, a vaccine will cost a person 408 Kenya shillings and it will target 1.25 million frontline workers, including community health workers and critical workers in terms of the target population at first. What do you make of some of these highlights in the COVID vaccine? Well, uh, thank you, viewers. The issue of the vac uh, COVID vaccine is uh, a good idea. It is the way to go. We cannot stop it. But the issue of changing the patients, the ordinary manainchi for that matter, I cannot see it work. Currently, we are having problems even in the education sector where now a parent is supposed to pay 500 shillings for, ex for CBC evaluation. And in my constituency particularly, mm -hmm. so many children right now are home because of 500 shillings from their parents. Now, if you go to the vaccine where you are told you'll be charged 480, I cannot see it work. Maybe we should import less if that is the way we want to go that will be charging. Very few I know can afford that. More so in situations where, well, we're already having even problems in testing. So I think the one point something million doses, when we are testing, I think about 3,000 now per day, mm -hmm. and our positivity rate at around 3%, that is 100 or so. Uh, I hope it will not be another scandal in the making. That is my take. 
Well, we'll definitely wait and see, even as Kenyans are urged to yeah. definitely stick within the guidelines released by the Ministry of Health. Well, that has been highlighted on page six and seven of the standard. Let's cross over to some BBI developments, which we will touch on briefly, bearing in mind we'll talk about it extensively later on during the weekend review segment. Right now, chaos rocks Baringo as Homer Bay passes referendum bill. It's proper to note that Homer Bay has joined CIA and Kisumu in passing the referendum bill, Baringo being one of the first counties to actually push down that particular bill. Also, uh, violence was actually seen within the precincts of that particular assembly, the county assembly, as they did conduct this business. Mark Bichachi, what's your take on this briefly? Uh, first, I'd just like to uh, correct my friend Kasim that vaccination is very different from testing uh, because testing requires a lot more preparation uh, and a lot more post handling of, of, the, of, the, of the samples because, uh, as you know, we've got very few machines, which is why our testing rate is low. However, uh, we know that our health workers are able to administer polio vaccines, measles vaccines, and many other vaccines without a scandal. I, 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 a professor has just called me the eternal optimist, uh, but let us also remember that we cannot uh, 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 postulate uh, failure for our own systems when we sit in charge of those systems. As a member of parliament, he should be telling us what he has done to ensure that there will be no corruption when the uh, vaccines uh, come come to us, uh, instead of telling us what might happen. You know, it's, 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 it's quite sad that that's how we view things. But uh, secondly, for me, uh, I, I, I do not think anyone would be surprised that Baringo County uh, would be torn uh, concerning the BBI. And this is not because of the content of the BBI. This is because of the supremacy wars between Gideon Moy, who is the Baringo senator, uh, William Samuel Arapurito, who considers himself uh, the, the Kalenjin Supremo, uh, of course there was going to be a bit of tension. What I find exceedingly regrettable is the fact that there was violence. I had a gunshot and these are the kinds of intolerant acts that we keep uh, 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 assuming, yet what they're doing is they're fermenting violence. Uh, in this country, uh, we, we saw Raila Odinga being stoned uh, by youth. We saw Gideon Moy being blocked from accessing places says in Nandi, uh, we saw CS Munya um, a staged workout because you could see uh, how specifically certain people had, had been orchestrated to work out. And all of these things may seem funny to us, but what we're doing is we are brooding intolerance. And this intolerance can be seen on social media. It can be seen in how conversations are being had. Kenyans are becoming more and more unreasonable. The argument is no longer about PPI. It's yeah. about um, Guruki, Muchawi, Mwizi, and all of those things. And, and slowly we we are descending into into the abyss that we were in in 2007 and and what needs to happen is kenyans need to be reminded that it is okay to disagree you know william ruto is not the only president there can be neither is raila odinga and guess what either by their term limits or the natural attrition of death we will have other leaders i do not know why kenyans are so obsessed that their leader must lead at any point in time All they right. are not gods eh, that we need to 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 defend so vehemently this is a total and absolute nonsense in my opinion and uh, to the kenyans who are involved in these matters of violence and intolerance including those who will treat me after this and say to you i am dynasty i am hustler i am not part of that nonsense i am a kenyan all right who has who has right thinking and i urge all kenyans to guard jealously the ability to have independent thoughts and independent ideas okay kasim tandaza well, what's your take on this even as we appreciate the fact that Parliament just yesterday did conclude its sitting at 9 p.m. in terms of uh, the first and second readings in the referendum bill. Uh, before matters BBI, I would want also to comment on what Bichachi concluded on the issue of vaccines. Mm -hmm. Vaccines previously have been free. This is the first time I think we are going to have a vaccine which will be at a cost to the general public. So I think this is the most critical point in terms of the COVID vaccine. But way forward to the matter BBI. I can trace this to 2010. 2010, 
uh, we were having the yes and the no camp. Uh, I would have thought about eight years of devolution, even for those who are in the no camp, would now have realized that devolution was the way to go. For me, from cost general, and I can say on this, I can be speaking on behalf of cost, we are de pro devolution. We asked for Majimbo right from independence. independence. And uh, way forward now, it is very sad for somebody to have seen the fruits of devolution, enjoying those fruits of devolution. And MCA, the conditions that he's uh, working in now, is like a parliament, not like the previously when he was in the county government. Those councillors and MCAs can tell the difference. The governors who are there, they are their courtes of devolution. And then you are saying, basically, not devolution. This total, I wouldn't want to use the word madness, but I think it's a total misnomer. It's, I don't think it is the right way of thinking. Okay. Because if you're enjoying the fruits of devolution, why say no? But as I've said, I can trace this to 2010. And going forward, we know we are going to have those who are right from the beginning didn't want devolution. They have their right to say no, even in the current circumstances. But since even in 2010, it was contested and it won, I'm still confident out of the 47 counties for sure. 24 counties should be able to rise to the occasion and strengthen devolution. Even as we talk about 24 counties rising to the occasion, Professor, briefly, your take on the issue of public participation. I know we've talked about this previously, but it again has cropped up. Baringo Assembly, um, all this fracas was centered on the uh, public participation, where some of the members claimed that they had instructions not to debate the bill before public participation. So well, what's your take on this? Yeah, you know, the BMBI is having challenges because in a constitutional arrangement, constitutional change, it's a social contract. It's the Kenyans agreeing on how they should be being governed. What is actually lacking in BMBI is ownership. Uh, Kenyans don't feel that they own this process. They feel that this process has been imposed on them. Even those Kenyans who I think are the biggest beneficiaries of the BMBI, for example, the Central Kenya, is the biggest beneficiary of the BBI. Uh, simply put, over the years, the constituencies have been set outside of the Central Kenya, outside of the population of the Central Kenya. BBI is correcting that. There was a mistake made in Ivasia on how to distribute, of course, I don't pass, I don't support the money distribution personally, and for very good reasons, because I strongly feel that the allocation of the counties should have strictly been limited to development projects, because we turned these counties into employment bureaus, thus converting the money going to counties into consumption and the consumption does not develop anything. So the way the BMBI is set, and the problem people are having with it, and I agree with the speaker, so of course it will pass, but it will pass because it's being forced, not really because people want it, because people don't separate the areas, the areas that we don't need. We don't need the expansion of the executive at all. People feel that a smaller, honest government a government that does not rob them, a government whose policy is not corruption. They think that the government would be better regardless of who ends it. So the idea of expanding the executive, they, some Kenyans just feel that is not right, that they need them to have a say, they don't have a say. The executive wouldn't be expanded. So they will be very unhappy people. Now, the expansion of parliament, like I said again, there is a way it could have been done, because sometimes we tend to run away from being honest and sincere. I believe if the Kenyans were confronted with the complete sincerity, that the central Kenya has been underrepresented in the parliament, they would have agreed to set up those constituencies without what appears to be lacuna in this law, which will loan the parliament beyond, because you keep on nominating until the gender equation is answered. And when is that? You could even go to 700. So there is all these uh, gaps that people are seeing. 
There is also gaps when you look at the statement that the Prime Minister will be the person who has the majority or the coalition of majority in Parliament. And then the lead of the opposition will be the person who comes second in the number of presidents to vote cast. Now you realize you could easily be in the 207 situation where Kevani comes in as the president with very few MPs, then Raila comes in with the majority. So in our situation here, assuming Raila becomes the president, Ruto comes with the majority, you see a situation where they are not even angry on how to form a government. That scares people. So the, the fracas in Baringo, I think we need to stop uh, seeing things <laughs> in extreme negativity. There is passions all the time. Uh, what we are saying there is passion. I don't know whether it's the spread as a battle. I don't, because I've seen people fighting in Megori, I've seen parliamentarians fighting in South Korea. So uh, we need to relax also as all right. people. But we need to cultivate cultivate the culture of having a civilized debate. Okay, Professor. A debate where you have a right to your disagreement with me and I respect that right. Well, it definitely doesn't need to get physical even as there are disagreements, but we'll definitely uh, continue monitoring the state of affairs in counties um, in terms of passing or rejecting the BBI. Let's highlight yet another story on page 8 of the Daily Nation touching on uh, the transport sector in the coast region where truckers are quite jubilant after the high court passed a verdict touching on the SGR where the government had ordered that all cargo from the port of Mombasa be transported to Nairobi by train on the standard gauge railway. The high court quashing that particular move by the government. Kasim, for obvious reasons, I'll start with you. What do you make of this? Uh, that is a win for the people of coast, but not only for the people of coast, as people normally imagine. The transport corridor, though it starts from Mombasa, it does not end in Mombasa. And uh, curtailing the road transport basically was a harm to the whole transport corridor from Mombasa to Malaba. Mm -hmm. It was not only Mombasa that was suffering. The subsequent towns of Umtito and Dei and Gweng beyond were all suffering. Of course, uh, 001 had made uh, commissioned a study and he had even come up with the numbers on how much just cost was losing in terms of that directive. Us as parliamentarians, we went to as far as threatening to impeach CS Macharia then because of the same issue. And uh, of course, it was suspended. Some of us were asking for withdrawal, not just suspension, but thank God it has reached to a point where the uh, court has also seen sense in that. And to me, that is the way to go. And uh, one of the reasons I believe which you are saying is the same thing about BBI public participation. It is now in our constitution. Mandatory even for the government. When they are to do, they are to make a drastic uh, pronouncement or a drastic measure to the public. We need public participation, and I don't think any public participation, however it's going to be done, it would have allowed that directive that all cargo be transported by the railways. While we know okay. it's the, rail, the transport sector where the public basically has a stake, unlike in the railway, which is basically wholly owned by the government and probably China. Well, yeah, we'll definitely continue monitoring this state of affairs. Let me cross over to Mark Bichachi. Even as you add your voice on that, the Daily Nation on the front page has highlighted something also touching on the transport sector in terms of infrastructure in the uh, City Expressway that is currently ongoing construction in terms. And now, there will be a burden where taxpayers are set to foot the bill of relocating utilities and compensating people who will be displaced along the way and then cough up more cash each time they use the 27-kilometer road. The expressway begins at Mlolongo, right then terminates at James Gishuru Road in Westlands. So what do you make of the burden or the extra burden as it comes, even though we appreciate the fact that infrastructure is quite key? Uh, let me first uh, undo uh, a misnomer. Um, that that we just said that that the um, SGR is probably owned by the Chinese. Um, 
that is an unfortunate statement. Our infrastructure is not foreign owned. We may take loans, but just the same way as you take a loan from the bank to buy a car, it does not mean the, the, the bank owns your car. Uh, that is not true. Um, secondly, I agree that the government did make a mistake on this particular issue. The, the way governments do, and this is a free market economy, if government, rightfully so, wants more cargo to go on the railway, which is faster, which is, um, which is supposed to decongest our roads, which is also supposed to increase um, the, the, the uh, lifespan of our roads, uh, we should get more cargo on, 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 on the railway. But how do you get more cargo on the railway? Number one, make it more efficient. If a businessman, if in fact, if someone who's handling cargo, even the lorry owners themselves, if they sit down and see that it is more efficient, it is faster, and it is cheaper to put your cargo on the railway, you have no doubt that that is what will happen. It is the same thing with what happened with uh, Kenya Airways and Jumbo Jet. If you go today to Jumbo Jet, today in the evening, and see the flights going to Mombasa, going to Eldoret, going to Kisumu, and how full they are, the government did not issue a directive telling Kenyans that if you uh, are traveling to outside of Nairobi, you must get on a plane. It is simply about efficiency and cost. It is the same reason why you can't book a ticket on SGR right now to go to Mombasa? Because it is full. Why is it full? Because of efficiency and cost. So if the government wants the SGR to work correctly, it must do what every other government does in an open market society such as Kenya. Make it competitive, make it something that is worth the while of the exporters and importers who are, who are doing business in this country. For as long as it is more efficient for someone to put their goods on a lorry, it will remain on a lorry. If you want to change that, do not go to uh, the root of the law, go to the root of business economics. That's how business people makes, make sense. And that is how also you get the buy-in of the same lorry drivers because you need to talk to them and talk to them about the termination of this freight. So when it gets to, to, to Nairobi, for example, how does it get from the SGR depot to, to, to where it's supposed to, the goods are finally needed? These are the kind of questions we need to answer. We need to move away from trying to solve business problems by edict and instead solve them by creating an environment that makes what the government sees for the good of the people as a feasible uh, project. All right, Mark Michachi, uh, before we continue with the conversation, allow us to break uh, some unfortunate news uh, where six people have been killed just this particular morning in an accident that has involved a trainer and a Nissan Matatu uh, uh, near St. Mary's Hospital at Gilgil along the Nairobi Nakuru Highway. Just to repeat it,